I want to start with your background. You've had a really interesting career path. You went from academia and physics to now really tech and data at MasterCard. How has that and your personal and uh, career background shaped your current role now at MasterCard? Thank you, Kate, and it's a pleasure being here with you. Um, you know, what I'd say is um, I still miss being in physics. I loved physics. You know, starting my career there, that was wonderful. What physics taught me was, you know, how to structure problems, how to uh, think about, you know, there's no problem that you can't solve is the first thing that you learn. And it's really important to experiment and test and be creative and look at it from every angle. And in data services, what we do is we help uh, businesses make smarter decisions to get to better outcomes, both in how they run their businesses, as well as in how they engage with their consumers. And so, you know, all that testing, experimentation, problem solving and structuring is relevant to us. So as an example, you know, we have a, a platform called Test and Learn. It's a software platform that many of our customers use. And to give you a concrete situation, you know, McDonald's came to us and said, hey, should we serve breakfast all day? Now, that's a very complicated problem. By the way, we know the answer is yes, because most <laughs> of us know that. But it's a complicated problem because you've got to think through the cost of the ingredients. You've got to think through what that means for the kitchen. You've got to think through, you know, is this seasonal? Who's going to buy this? Is this incremental sales or is it going to substitute what somebody else buys? So is it going to cannibalize existing sales? And so they use test and learn. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, once we uh, worked with them to t set up the experiments and tests and figure out what works and what doesn't, the conclusion was that um, it's not a novelty or a seasonal effect. It's a, it's a sustainable effect. And the effect actually has two benefits. It attracted new customers who just came in late and loved buying breakfast. And existing customers also ended up spending more and buying more. So net-net, it was a double positive. And so we did that work for them. Now, what we'll tell you is on average, about 40% of our experiments, and it varies from problem to problem, obviously, but about 40% of experiments don't work. And what I'll say is it's equally important to know what doesn't work as it is to know what works. Because if you do massively parallel testing and you, and you can cut back on what doesn't work very quickly and double down on what works, you get much, uh, get to the right answer faster and you also get it with a lot better return on investment, a lot better outcomes. So yes, uh, so there is a journey from physics to what I do today and I, <laughs> I love that journey. I would be among those voting yes for all day breakfast. Uh, really interesting <laughs> example there. Um, but you guys are really looking at billions of transactions. It comes with a lot of data. How are you visualizing that? How are you storing that data and then helping customers make sense of it all? I would think a big part of this is probably combing through that data and explaining it to customers in a way that they can really use in a, a tangible way. No, absolutely. It starts with uh, being responsible and being principled about it, right? So our data responsibility principles around, you know, um, consumers' rights to data, transparency, accountability. And it's uh, coupled with other principles such as, you know, building products that minimize the use of data or privacy by design. And then really thinking through what that means from a governance point of view, from a process point of view, testing, et cetera, to set up guardrails that protect the consumer protect the business and actually, you know, are uh, responsible. So, for example, you know, making sure the responsibility includes removing biases. Biases can creep in into a data set that you're using in many different ways. It can creep into the algorithms. You can actually codify what you do today, which could be biased. So you've really got to think about, you know, the impact, the consequences, and make sure you're regularly and systematically removing biases. So I call all those guardrails, right? It's important to set up those guardrails. And then within those guardrails, uh, then you can unleash innovation and creativity to think about how to do something better, how to do something differently. And we, you know, with our customers, use data-driven decision-making, AI, machine learning, and pretty much every product we use, including products. I mean, you'll immediately jump to insights and software as a service products, but also in products like consulting, which is, you know, when I started in consulting, it was all, uh, you know, human beings on teams, and we built... Excel models, and uh, now actually, if you take something like our cyber consulting, we actually have algorithms and AI that we deploy. So when we go into a customer to identify vulnerabilities, it's done with algorithms and AI. And then there's more of the human time can be spent on thinking through you know, which vulnerabilities are the most important to cure, the easiest to cure, the, the most critical ones to cure, and coming up with a much more actionable plan that creates more impact. 
so you can use the human capital for higher value added activities. So yes, we have uh, data driven innovation all over uh, what we do. That's a great point about some of the potential biases as well. Uh, I want to shift to some of the data patterns you've seen during the pandemic in, in terms of what's changed in consumers' lives. Anything the audience can glean based on what MasterCard has pulled out of the data and what to expect in the new normal going forward based on MasterCard's data? You know, what the pandemic taught us is that uh, you, you can't, uh, you know, things change very rapidly. So yesterday's insights were irrelevant. Yesterday's consumer behavior was irrelevant. Yesterday's uh, you know, approach was irrelevant. So it made us pivot very quickly, and we helped a lot of our customers do this, to what's currently relevant, what's happening right now. And that, that continues even coming out of the pandemic. So in the pandemic, there were things like, I'll give you an example, the shift to digital and the acceleration of digital. Coming out of it now, it's about digital and physical, but not separately. It's about digital and physical mixing together in, in new ways. And so what I'd say is that that insight from the pandemic carries forward, which is you've got to be very current on what customers are doing, how they're behaving, you know, uh, what uh, insights you have, and the ability to pivot, to be agile, to adjust, and coming back to, to innovate and to be creative around it and to test and make sure you're innovating in the right way is, is critically important. So that continues now post-pandemic and um, will always continue. I think in this world, we need to be a lot more agile and data-driven in everything that we do, um, just given the world we live in. That's really interesting on some of the real-time data. Was there a preference to maybe extrapolating from what was happening during the pandemic and sort of applying that to the future? I know that's happened in consumer payments. There was this sort of pull forward of, oh, everybody's going to move to online payments, for example, because that's what was happening during the pandemic. Have you seen things kind of normalize and shift and how are you adjusting when it comes to real-time data? So, you know, I'll talk about commerce. You know, when I think about our company now, we're a data and technology company in commerce, payments and beyond. And, uh, you know, what is possible today when you think about consumer behavior is uh, there are lots more things possible today than ever before uh, in terms of experiences. And what we've seen post-pandemic is a return to a lot of those experiences, you know, whether that's travel, we see travel rebounding, consumer and corporate travel, whether it's experiences around dining or entertainment. And so you see a lot of that and you see a mixture of digital and physical. Digital now has evolved too. There are so many new ways of interacting digitally and uh, digital and physical, physical are mixing together. And there's a huge variety of things that are out there that are possible. And the, that makes it even more important to be innovative and to be data driven in deciding what to do, what not to do, what's most current and important to do. And MasterCard deals with a lot of financial data as well. That is especially vulnerable, especially important to protect. How do you think about security and cybersecurity in the context of some of this more sensitive financial data? So, you know, uh, we see a lot of data. We see about uh, 210 billion transactions for consumer cards alone from about 3 billion cards in 210 countries. But when it comes to privacy and security, we're very principled about it. Uh, and by the way, we have other sources of data. We have third-party data. And we, uh, uh, you know, mingle all of this to tease out insights, which is really what's valuable. But in doing that, you've got to be very principled about it. You've got to think about privacy. You've got to think about security. You've got to think about biases. So, for example, when we deploy AI, we have our principles. We also have a governance body. We have an AI council that has our chief, chief data officer, our chief privacy officer, our, our chief risk officer, and our head of AI. And they think about governance. And we do things like we take our data scientists, we train them, we teach them how to look for biases in data sets, look for biases in the models that they build. We have a lot of testing. We have communities where if they want to talk to each other and get each other's advice, it's possible to do that. And they can always escalate something to the AI council as well. And so we have a lot um, of tests, both in terms of the data that's used, as well as the algorithms, al algorithms that are built, as well as the impact. You've got to make sure it's doing what you want it to do, and it's not doing what you don't want it to do. And that um, is true when you, you know, start doing it, as well as on, on an ongoing basis, because you can have things like you know, drift in models that you need to look out for. So we're very, very disciplined about a lot of this around security and privacy as we uh, unleash our innovation uh, around the guardrails that we have. And uh, it's, not, uh, it's also not one and done, right? It's an ongoing evolutionary process where you keep getting better, you keep learning from what you do, and you, uh, you know, on this journey of doing it better, faster, and uh, in an improved manner.